Let me first say, uh, my name is Jacob, and I am so honored to be here, uh, to be around so many like-minded people. It's just incredible. You know, beyond saying thank you to Peaceful Streets, and I'm, I'm really excited to have Bobby Seal here. I've been cop-watching since 2000. I live in Oakland, California. So naturally, uh, I, I did my research on the Black Panthers. And, uh, you know, if you guys don't know, in the 60s, they were patrolling their police with shotguns and law books. So I moved to Oakland in 2000. I was seeing a lot of stuff happening in front of me, and I, I felt compelled to do something. And you know, this was pre-tech revolution. We didn't have YouTube, we didn't have streaming, we didn't have all these things, right? I did have a video camera, because I was shooting videos. Um, so yeah, I wanted to do something. So there's a group called Cop Watch out there. They started in 1990, and I got in touch with them, and I got in touch with, uh, with some lawyers, just to make sure I knew what I was doing. And I hit the streets. You know, and in, in Oakland in 2000, at that time period, there was a gang of cops called the Riders who were out there kidnapping people and torturing them and planting guns on them and whatnot. And so I got to tell you, after about a, a month of doing this, I realized that I, if I was really going to be about this, if I was really going to go out and proactively watch the police to better situations for other people, that I had to join up with people. And so I joined up with Berkeley Cop Watch. And a quick background of them is, is they started in 1990 in Berkeley and they were trying to defend homeless people against police. And so they went out there with video cameras and they started documenting what was happening and it quickly had traction and actually police were less inclined to do things that were illegal or bad when there was a video camera there. And these are gonna be reoccurring conversations that we have throughout today and for the rest of our lives about this stuff. But essentially, I don't know, I, I joined in with them and um, yeah, they started in 1990 and a year later was Rodney King, so of course that spread across the country, the idea that we could all watch the police, right? And so after 1990, more cop watch groups started establishing themselves around the country. And uh, I myself joined in 2000, and I kind of felt it would be a good idea to make a Know Your Rights video. I hadn't seen one to date. So I got in the streets, and I started documenting, uh, you know, your rights and how they were abused and how they could work and I came up with something called these streets are watching and I released it in 2004 you can find it online it's for free please watch it it overviews your rights when stopped by the police and when you see something happening and you want to make a difference uh, like I said you know YouTube was not around back then we didn't have a lot of ways to share our information and to be in touch people were just starting to use the internet you know websites and whatnot but uh, but as YouTube came and uh, as this tech thing evolved, suddenly we have uh, camera phones, right, and, and cameras, and we have this ability to really record these things and, and get them out to other people. So, you know, with that also came people like Carlos Miller, who is in the crowd today and has done an incredible job at uh, highlighting the abuses of authorities, you know, around people's right to document things such as police actions or public buildings or whatever. Um, and also, you know, with that came a, another incident that really emboldened everybody's understanding of a right to watch the police. I don't know if you guys have heard of Oscar Grant, but again, in Oakland, California, on January 1st in 2009, a young man was uh, fatally shot on a train in front of hundreds of passengers, and many people were actually had their cameras out and were videotaping. And they weren't cop watchers, they were ordinary people. And I think that's a really, was a really important moment for me as a cop watcher who was always trying to spread the gospel, get organized, be safe, you know, get partners, go do this proactively. All of a sudden you have these people thinking for themselves about their right to do it. And I guess that's kind of where, I don't know, I, I ended up seeing one day a uh, video of Pete Ayer, who here he is now, um, video of him in Santa Fe, cop watching with a video camera and a handgun. And I was just completely inspired. Like, here's a guy I've never heard of, you know, this is pre-cop lock, but I think that's where I feel like I'm going to introduce you and get you in here to talk a little bit about cop lock. But I think, you know, cop lock is a group that started in that kind of era where a lot of people are starting to, to, to come and act on their own authority and, and to do things under whatever banner, under whatever, you know, moral principles they feel. So come on, Pete, get in. So uh, as Jacob and uh, the MC pr probably mentioned, uh, the topic of our speech is a growing movement. So I'm just going to touch on cop lock as part of that growing movement. And uh, to echo what Jacob, I heard him say, and what John Bush has already said, this is mainly about ideas, and a lot of it comes down to uh, what I would say first and foremost is, you know, about self-ownership and thus the right to act without being aggressed upon by someone who claims to be your authority. 
So I think that really underpins this whole conversation, hopefully this whole summit today. And I, if that's one thing people can walk away from, I hope it's that, that you know you own yourself and that, that will give you some solstice if, if someone comes at you with threats of a cage or a ransom, knowing that at the end of the day, if you're not hurting anybody, you know, you, you shouldn't be afraid. And there's people out here that will support you in that. But uh, to speak specifically about Coplock, it's an organization that got started in, in early 2010. Uh, my buddy, Damo Freeman, some of y'all may know, started it. He had, uh, like many of us here, had experienced some uh, less than subpar, or some subpar uh, protection afforded by the local uh, so-claimed authorities. And, you know, he worked through the internal mechanisms, as some of us are told to do, to, to, to seek a remedy, or to find a remedy, but uh, obviously, people who claim a monopoly on force, people who claim the right to steal your money to then protect you, don't really have the right incentives to bring about that protection and justice and accountability. So what, it, what Adamo did was start a, a blog called Coplock, it started on a Tumblr site, and myself and a number of other folks joined him there shortly after, and it turned into a group blog. We started commenting on situations we saw elsewhere, and we started doing call floods to support people, and that was really something I think that set cop lock apart, it was using the tools and the technology that Jacob spoke of, the cameras and the, the interconnect, more interconnected networks to, to allow people who maybe don't even know anyone in their area to put out their story, to document it and disseminate it so that we could all support each other. So cop lock then grew to what it is today, which is more of a decentralized Intel hub. You know, there's a bunch of resources on there uh, that have some of them have been taken from Copwatch resources and, and tweaked. Some of them have been created anew. Uh, some of them have been found elsewhere. But uh, really what, uh, what Coplock to me epitomizes as part of this growing movement conversation is an idea. And Coplock is decentralized. It essentially says, you know, badges don't grant extra rights. And so whatever, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see some cop watchers here from that, that have started groups and in places across the states, there's now groups across the world, and that really shows uh, the universality of this idea we're talking about, that badges don't grant extra right, that someone doesn't have authority just because it's claimed. And I think we saw that, um, you know, really represented. I know John went over Antonio's situation uh, back in New Year's of 2012, but, you know, the fact that Antonio was wronged and he was threatened and instead of being scared and taking a plea deal so he didn't spend time in a cage, he knew it was right to speak up. And fortunately, a lot of good people, you know, came together around that. So that's really what we're trying to do, trying to, with this growing movement, is to erode the divisiveness that the so-claimed authorities, you know, uh, want us, want us uh, th that they ultimately rely on. You know, they don't, they don't want us to work together. They want us to look at them for solutions and to work through their systems. So uh, that's where we're at today, I'm, I'm happy to say. So. Yeah, I, I just wanted to cut in too. I mean, how amazing is it that Antonio on New Year's uh, documents something that he sees as wrong and he's doing it right in front of the police, right? He's taking a stand, very, very honorable. And then while he's being abused, there's actually somebody else across the street videotaping. I mean, that's what's so magical about it. and. You know, it's stuff like that that makes me and, and Pete realize that, that, and all of us, I guess, since we're all sitting here, that we're in a moment, a very, very interesting moment in time. Uh, Pete and I have actually decided that we would best allocate our time this year going on a tour and linking up with these different peaceful streets and cop block and cop watch and all groups. I mean, this, in Oakland, we've got the Black Riders for Liberation and they're out in the streets cop watching. We've got a lot of different people out there. And, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend the next four months going to cities across America. We're gonna be meeting with different groups and, um, and really, you know, initially our goal is to create on the ground connections. You know, uh, look at Pete and I, are, we have, I guess, different banners, but we're here doing the same thing. And, and likewise with Peaceful Streets, we're all non-violently, you know, documenting police. We're trying to make a situation better. We're trying to get people out of handcuffs, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, we're gonna be doing that. We're gonna be doing a lot of cop watching, but we're also gonna be doing a lot of skill sharing. We've got a lot to learn, and we, we think that while these connections will be very helpful for people supporting each other and what they're doing on the ground, that if we can disseminate timely information, maybe something that we're seeing in Chicago can benefit somebody in Denver. We're all dealing with the same pig, but it's, it's different. You know, every, every culture, every town 
it's a, it's a different thing, and we can't tell you what to do. We, we, don't, we can only give suggestions, but what we're finding is, is that we can put out enough information, you know, you're gonna be able to go on to, on to Coplock slash Tor and, and, and see something that makes sense to apply in your own community. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll just step in. Um, Jacob said, you know, this is, uh, each town is different, but ultimately the uh, issues, we meet a lot of folks on the road or who email us at our different outlets, as I'm sure you guys have had conversations with people who would say, oh, we have the most corrupt or the most brutal or whatever police department. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, all these police departments, again, they, they, these are individuals, even if they're guided by good intentions when they first take this position, they're, they're working for organizations that operate they're, it's a, on violence. It's a coercive institution that say, we have a right to steal your money to protect you. You're never going to get accountability or justice. You can never fix that institution. So what we're trying to do is to share ideas that empower each of us individually and so that we look to each other and, and support each other and you know, we can ignore those folks who claim to, the uh, right to control us and, uh, you know, ultimately just uh, create a better reality. So the, the, uh, the idea of uh, us getting out there acting as a catalyst, I hope, will help, uh, you know, these ideas spread so ultimately we can live in a world free from this institutionalized violence, free from where it's supposedly okay for some folks to do things wrong for others. Yeah, um, I would also want to throw in there you know, me personally, when I started this journey back in 2000, uh, you know, the word cop watch wasn't out there, and watching the police with video cameras wasn't necessarily the most popular thing. I, I hadn't really heard of it too much, but I don't know, my goal was to, in my lifetime, have it that everybody knew the word cop watch, because if you know cop watch, that means you know you can watch the police, and it means that you know your rights. Um, and if you know your rights, then you, you are becoming awake. And the less scared we are of, of the police, and the more we take care of ourselves, I think the more we can have conversations uh, about how do we live in a world without police? How do we take care of ourselves? Because I know me personally, there's nothing a cop can do that I can't do for myself. And there's nothing that a cop can do that I wouldn't rather rely on, on real compassionate people. You know, in Oakland during Occupy, we actually had some success creating uh, police-free zones. You know, we had an encampment, and whereas other Occupies, the police would walk through and patrol and do all that stuff, when they came to us, we'd actually physically push them out. And, um, and it worked, and it worked for a month. We, the cops could not enter our encampment. Um, but with that also came a lot of responsibilities because we had such a tight group of people living together all the problems and issues uh, that we have in this world were, were falling out in front of our front doorsteps. Um, and what was really interesting is, is how we developed forms and senses of security that didn't involve replacing the police with another security apparatus. What we would have is um, we'd have people at night with their walkie-talkies, you know, just walking around. But if there was something that actually required, you know, I don't want to call it intervention, but, you know, something of that level, it wasn't upon the uh, security person to act upon them. It wasn't their authority to be like a cop, to be the judge, jury, and executioner. What they would do is call upon the community, and the community would come out, and we would deal with it 30 deep. And I think that, I don't know, that's one thing that I, I definitely walked away with. I'd never been in a police-free zone, and I'd never had that kind of experience. And after Occupy, you know, we started having these conversations of, well, how can we bring that kind of security into our own lives, you know, without being security apparatuses and being thugs like the cops. And, you know, one thing with me with Cop Watch is I've always had text services. I'll do a little mass text. I'll, uh, hey, there's a police stop here. I'm going to it. Um, and then if there was a problem, I'd text out again for more support. And that was pretty cool. And I think actually, don't you guys, yeah, um, why don't you speak on that? Yeah, I just mentioned uh, we're talking about uh, how to get there from here, I guess, to cre create a better reality. What can we individually do? And it starts first and foremost with yourself. Again, don't look at, don't look, or in, even in conversation with others, you know, if you don't believe it the case, refer to police employees as officials or authorities. You know, if, you, if we continue to use the, the, that sort of jargon, it continues to create this double standard, you know, like John unpackaged the, the word civilian, you know, if, if, is a police employee not a civilian, or, you know, is it, if we continue to view this as, as us and them, the division's always gonna be there, and instead we just need to, 
to uh, if we want to operate according to love and want to be around people based on you know looking out for each other that's what we need to do and just do it and to the greatest extent as we can not rely on those services provided uh, or claim to be provided but uh, ultimately uh, you know the technology that Jacob mentioned is going to be instrumental uh, there's a resources page at Coplock that has info on how to set up a, a mass text message system so there's in New Hampshire where I come from there's uh, Shire, there, there's a uh, pork four and one. People can call in and blast out a message that's been replicated here in Central Texas and in Arizona and in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, so that's a, a good service. If you have a smartphone, many of us have free streaming apps to be able to capture footage and record it off site so it can't be deleted. I know myself and other folks have had footage deleted by people who claim to protect us. So again, I just uh, really underscore this. It, the, this is supposedly about a growing movement, but for me it's about sharing ideas and getting us back. It's not necessarily that we're getting to somewhere new, it's getting to where we should be. We're, we're trying to uh, sh shed the artificial uh, paradigm that a lot of us grew up in, that, that some folks say they have a right to protect us and that they alone have this ability. And I think, uh, as most of us can attest to, most of our day, most of our interactions throughout the day are, are involve peaceful coexistence you know, and, and at least toleration and not uh, aggression. And, and generally the, the folks who are levying aggression and exclusively the people who levy aggression and claim the legitimate right to do so wear badges, you know, so we need to hopefully move past that failed paradigm and get back to, to a system where we uh, look out for each other. When there was situations, instead of someone stepping in and, and using violence or, or aggravating the situation, actually try to diffuse it, melding with the person, and, and try to deal with this, it that way. And that definitely, I mean, the uh, reputation-based systems, uh, you know, could go a long way. Oh, yeah. In, in, in Sharon, Mexico, uh, there's a small town in southern Mexico where they recently kicked the cops out of their town. They were working with the narco... Uh, you know, squads, uh, I don't know, just uh, tearing down trees and all sorts of stuff. And so they had to replace their own security service. And they did it by actually having people that were rotating so nobody would ever have, you know, that kind of authority for that long. But also they, they, they looked to their elders for, for ways of justice that had existed before these institutions. And, you know, one the best example I can have is there was a bar fight since that time and somebody died in that fight. And the family, uh, the, the man that, that took the life of the other man is, is responsible for the rest of his life, not only for his family, but that other family. And I'm not saying that that's justice, but there are other things that, that, that can work than, than just caging people. And I got to say that real quick, too. I think we're really almost done, but we got we to gotta focus on this uh, prison industrial complex. It's what feeds the cops. They're making money off it, um, and it's destroying people's lives. So I, I don't think we can go after the cops without dealing with uh, breaking down those walls at all, I mean, uh, as well. And also, you know, real quick too, if you guys are about this stuff, there are so many resources, just, just plug in wherever you are. And, and if you see something, like put it on Coplock is a great site, it's humongous at this point. Your, your information will get out there. Um, do what you do and do it well. But if you're gonna really do it well, line up with other people. And then once you line up with other people and start doing it, start working with other groups that are doing the same damn thing. You know, as far as I'm concerned, like in my life, like you have all these different groups and if we all actually overcame what creates these divisions, you know, if we really combated racism and patriarchy, misogyny, homophobia in our own lives, we would have a lot greater chances at getting rid of the police. And so take that very serious when, when you're looking and pointing at what you hate about the cops. We are a sick society and we need to get better. And uh, that's something that we all have to take into our own personal lives. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I, I know what I have to do for myself and I, I do it. I would just say we know the solution to these issues that we a lot of us see and recognize uh, aren't going to be solved from the top down through continuing to look to a claimed authority to fix the solution. We have to come from the bottom up and see what emerges spontaneously. So I appreciate all y'all efforts on that front.